What's going on guys? You know, it's not a stretch for me to say that the Nintendo Switch is my number one gaming platform. It easily gets the most work out of any of my consoles. Because of that, I've gotten greedy. And as the patron saint of gamers Wario says, greed is good. Here's five more games I would like to see ported to the Switch. Let's take a look. Alright, well here's a flash fact about me. I love tennis. I used to play back when I was a kid, and while I'm terrible at it, it's always been a sport I really love. And that love was reinforced back in 2005 with the release of Top Spin 2 on the 360. I was introduced to this game back when I worked at EA on NASCAR Thunder 2005, and I played it frequently with my buddy Ian during downtime waiting for new builds to compile or be burned. It's got a lot of nostalgia, to be sure, but there's more than just good memories here. There's a solid backbone of tennis simulation that the Switch is sadly lacking in. Looking at the eShop right now, there's a few tennis sim options, but none of them look to capture the mix of solid gameplay and style that Top Spin 2 carried. It's almost refreshing to boot up Top Spin 2 today and see a stripped down, bare bones interface that doesn't overwhelm you with options like current sports options from EA. You get Exhibition, which allows you to play as any of the built in pros on the disc, including Roger Federer, Andy Roddick, Venus Williams, Anna Kornikova, and Rafa Nadal. You can also play a custom tournament, a career mode, which allows you to build a, granted for the time, fairly detailed character to carry through the game, party games, and an online mode. I look at this and I compare it to the number of cards and submenus and options and customizable UI in games I love like NHL 20, and I realize that all you really need is a direct gateway to fun, solid simulation. I'd love to see this remastered and brought over to the Switch, and if you could update the roster to bring in pros like Novak Djokovic, Dmitry Medvedev, Serena Williams, or Ashley Barty, you're in good shape. I honestly regret how long it's taken me to get around to playing Brutal Legend from Double Fine. This game is just dripping in style. I mean, it starts off with a video featuring Jack Black, who is also the main voice in the game. As you're being guided through a record store by Jack, he shows you an album, which becomes your interface. It's gorgeous, simple, and amazing. And that's just the interface and the intro video. Once you're in-game, things just double down on the metal influence and amazing design work. You play as Eddie, a roadie for a late 2000s boy band called Cabbage Boy. I feel it's really important to let you know that that was Cabbage Boy with a K, because that really bugs me for some reason. Eddie regrets not being born in the early 70s, so he could experience when music was real. Through a series of unfortunate events, Eddie dies and is transported to the fantasy world of Ormageddon, which looks like it stepped off the cover of all of Eddie's favorite metal albums. Gameplay thus far for me has been a mix of classic 3D action platformer hack and slash, though I know there's RTS elements in the game as well. Honestly, I haven't played very far in this yet, but I'm just so overwhelmed with the style and love letter that's been written to heavy metal by this game that I had to include it here. The game features voice work from the aforementioned Jack Black, as well as metal giants like Lemmy, Lita Ford, Ozzy Osbourne, and Rob Halford from Judas Priest. And as impressive as all that is, what's even more incredible is the game's soundtrack. I won't play any of it here because I don't have a good lawyer on Retainer, but here's some of the songs on the soundtrack. Metal Thrashing Mad by Anthrax, Oblivion by Mastodon, We Are the Road Crew by Motorhead, Dr. Feelgood by Motley Crue, Super Beast by Rob Zombie, and seriously, so many more. It's a game about a love of heavy metal and revels in its presentation. Fantastic, fun, over the top, gory, and profane. Brutal Legend is amazing. Hey look, a second sports game! And while I know most people would immediately default to SSX Tricky, and seriously, who could fault you if you did? You can't go wrong with that. Tricky is incredible. I have a lot of appreciation for what EA did with the SSX series released for the 360 and PS3 generation in 2012. There's a ton going on with this game, but the biggest change is that the game shifted from using more fantastical locations to using real-world locales that were actually mapped by NASA satellites for your snowboarding needs. There were also a bunch of gameplay changes. They added wingsuits, deadly descent levels that limit the number of rewinds you can use, as well as giving you different challenges, and a massive world tour mode that takes you all over the world with a metric ton of events to compete in. And they brought back the Tricky Meter, which was sorely lacking in SSX3, and gives an air of over-the-top insanity to an otherwise fairly straightforward snowboarding game. The game has a plot, for lack of a better term, where you need to defeat Griff, one of the characters from the previous SSX games that is now your team's rival. You start off as Zoe, and along the way you can unlock classic characters like Elise, Simon, Mac, and Kiori. And, as is always the case with SSX, the soundtrack is killer. Featuring a swath of rock, hip-hop, and electronic music, the game also allowed you to add a custom soundtrack so you could shred your favorite music. 
Want to drop into Jimmy Buffett's Margaritaville or the 1812 Overture? Do it. And more impressively, the game will dynamically remix anything you're playing with its harmony system, meaning as you play and pull off bigger tricks, the songs will update and evolve with your score. It's flippin' incredible, and adds so much to the game. Sure, Tricky is brilliant, but SSX 2012 is nearly perfect. All right, straight up, the lack of Injustice or Injustice 2 on the Switch is absolutely baffling to me. We've had Mortal Kombat 10 and 11, so the Injustice franchise being ignored makes absolutely zero sense. For those that don't know, the Injustice series features your favorite DC characters and Hellboy and the Ninja Turtles via DLC in a compelling story where Superman snapped after the Joker killed Lois Lane and everyone at the Daily Planet. Injustice 2 picks up after the events of the first game, and Brainiac has his eyes set on Earth, meaning Batman and his fellow heroes need to look at both Superman and those that fought alongside him to assist them in defeating Brainiac. I'm not going to spoil the plot, but it goes about as well as you'd expect. And while I personally love the storyline, I can't begrudge people who don't get into it. So it's a good thing that Injustice 2 really triumphs on the quality of its gameplay, and 90% of its design aesthetic. Featuring simple controls and special moves to pull off, the game is easy for anyone to pick up and play, but there's a depth involved with the super meter for the game. Yeah, you can store it up to pull off a devastating and ostentatious move, or you can burn it to avoid attacks. It's a balancing act that tips on a knife edge, and it's so perfectly designed that once you start getting into the groove of the game, you'll keep seeing ways to improve based on those mechanics. There's also some awesome interactive elements in each stage, allowing you to throw objects at your opponents or use things like chandeliers or banners to swing in and attack your opponents from above. And most of the design work in the game is fantastic. A lot of the characters look great and the environments are amazing. And yeah, while they are ostentatious, the super moves you can build up to are over the top and amazing. The biggest failing appearance-wise is that some of the characters that feature in the first game like The Flash and Batman are a bit... Uh, overdesigned, shall we say. Being my favorite hero, Flash's costume should be sleek and smooth, so I have a hard time jiving with the segmented armor and bizarre wings on his helmet. It's the same issue I had with the Flash's costume from the Justice League film. I don't particularly love the loot drop system that the game employs, but honestly it's not terrible. It's kind of fun to find out what character you're going to get gear for to alter their appearance and abilities a bit. It's honestly probably my favorite fighting game from the last four or five years, and on a system starved for quality fighting games, Injustice 2 would be a game changer. It makes absolutely zero sense to me why Knights of the Old Republic and Knights of the Old Republic 2 haven't been remastered yet, or at the very least, re-released on the Switch. I can get KOTOR and KOTOR 2 on my damn iPad. There's zero reason it can't be on the Switch. Knights of the Old Republic is one of the most groundbreaking role-playing games in history, featuring a moral choice system that influences whether your character serves the light side, dark side, or is in perfect balance with the Force. By today's standards, the gameplay might seem a little bit clunky, Simple attack mechanics and pauses as you enter combat aren't the norm for modern action RPGs, but it works brilliantly in KOTOR. You can choose one of three classes, Soldier, Scout, or Scoundrel that influence your overall stats and feats, but from there, you're free to do what you want. Sure, be a soldier that's an expert at slicing computers. Everyone loves an explosives expert scout. The universe is your cantina and you can order off the secret menu to completely tailor the game to your expectations of what you want your character to be. Beyond just your character, though, are your companions. Featuring a ragtag group of pilots, Mandalorians, Twi'lek, murderous assassin droids that really, really, really don't like you, a Wookiee, and astromechs, you're able to fully outfit each character in whatever way you see fit. Featuring a massive assortment of locations, a menagerie of creatures, alien races, and all kinds of Star Wars Easter eggs and references, it's easy to see why this game has influenced so much of the fandom and the content that's being produced today by Lucasfilm. Hell, Darth Revan was set to be referenced in Rebels, and there's talk of the Old Republic universe established in these games as being a touchstone for future Disney Plus series developments. In the latest season of The Mandalorian, there's a Krayt Dragon fight that was clearly inspired by this series. Its influences are everywhere, and its contributions important and enormous. A KOTOR and KOTOR 2 collection on one cartridge would be incredible. All right, guys, so there you have it. Five games I would love to see come over to the Switch. In particular, I am shocked that Injustice 2 and KOTOR haven't been here already. That's just me. So now I want to hear from you all. Let me know in the comments down below if there are any classic games or modern games you'd like to see come over to the Switch and why. Now try to keep it in control. Don't put any first party Sony or first party Microsoft games over there. Things you think could actually make it. Let's try to be realistic. If you guys enjoyed today's video, please be sure you like it down below and share it out with the folks who you think might dig our content. And if you haven't subscribed already, 
shame on you. But hey, it's the holiday season and I am feeling forgiving. Go ahead and click that subscribe button down below and ring the notification bell so you can stay up to date with everything we've got coming up. Until next time, guys, I have been Jay. I appreciate you being here and giving us some of your time to watch this video. Remember to play more games, stay square, and take care. We'll talk to you soon.